Hello, and welcome to Statistically indis- Indistinct. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, That's the name for the configuration where it's just you and me. Yeah, yeah. Statistically Indistinct. Uh, as you may have guessed from what Dean just said, it's just him and me today. Bart is off sick, unfortunately not gallivanting around the place. Poor lad. He'll be back next time we record. And it's a bonus episode. It's bonus episode 20, which feels like a really, really big number, but also not such a big number given, you know, podcasts that we listen to have like hundreds of bonus episodes. I'll be honest, I can't remember a single past bonus episode. The the one about chaos with the, the biblically accurate angel. Oh, that's it. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I do remember them. And the simulation and the AI stuff. And... So what I'm hearing is that there, I remember a lot of bonus episodes, I just don't remember that they were bonuses. Yes. Okay. It's all right. I don't either. <laughs> oh, fair enough. I just, Look, I just show up, I give my best performance, mm. and then you handle all the petty stuff. <laughs> yes. It's true. It's true. Uh, this episode is about nutritional labeling regulations. Because it turns out there's actually a lot more stats involved than you might imagine. And shockingly, we're going to see some ideology. It can't be ideology, it's stats. <laughs> it's just true. It's just true things. You may or may not have ever actually looked on some pa- food packaging and read one of these nutritional information panels and things, but they exist. And uh, there are a lot of discussions in government and public health and industry and things about what should be on them and how you should calculate it. Here are a couple of examples. These are from my kitchen. I think the first one is a packet of prunes, and the second one is a box, or a carton, sorry, of oat milk. Oh, prunes. <laughs> Love that shit. Mm-hmm. And what you can see here is that we have title, it says nutrition information, we have information on serving size and how many there are per packet, we have some stuff. Oh, now I see the ideology, there's trans in there. Well, as a fat trans, um, <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about the, the fat in this. And then you have, so this is quantity per serving. We'll talk more about this, so these percentages later in the uh, in the program. And in this last one is average quantity per 100 grams, or in the case of fluids, average quantity per 100 mil. If you're American, um, mil and gram are... Uh... <laughs> 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 Would you believe that even the American ones are in grams? I'm just trying to think. Which is pretty... Like gram is equal to... They, they're they com- comparable in a way. How, what's I the comparable? I think it's about 240 grams is a pound. No, 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 no. I mean, the, a gram and a milliliter. Yeah, so one gram is a cubic millili- A cubic centimeter of water is one milliliter of water. Right, got you. Yeah, so, I mean... Metric has standards like that. Yeah, they it all into waves. Yeah. See our episode on measurement systems for more about how Imperial arose, or somewhat more organically, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was just trying to work that out. Anyway, uh, I've just demonstrated to American listeners that even I don't know what I'm fucking talking about when it comes <laughs> to this stuff, so... That's all right. I mean, the, the fact that the American panels are also in grams feels slightly pathological. It does... Not related to what we were just literally just talking about, but looking at these images here, it occurs to me that I often look at these and go, yep, I'm glad there's food in this. <laughs> well, maybe you're going to learn something today. Is, it, is the ideology also present where it says nil detected in cholesterol, like it's bragging a little? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'd so have broken is... glass, nil detected. <laughs> or perhaps it would be a case of uh, raising a lot of questions that... <laughs> my shirt. The my well, nutrition information is already answering. So we're going to have a look uh, at a simpler example, because these are pretty complex, on the next slide. But you see some stuff here that is related to specific health claims. So generally the rule is you have to have some list of stuff. We'll talk about more on the next page. And then if you make any specific health claims, you have to include information related to that. Cholesterol is not on the standard list, but if you're making claims around does it or does it not have cholesterol, then you should put that in there. Right. Uh, if we look at the oat milk, for example, you have claims about lactose yeah. and added sugar. You have claims about dietary fiber as well. I don't know what beta glucan is but i think from from looking at this uh type setting it looks like that is a particular type of soluble fiber yeah it doesn't stand up for itself a lot (laughs) Uh, it's not very assertive when it comes to negotiating its position etc indeed and calcium here you see is related to a specific health claim in this labeling in particular calcium for strong bones okay yeah Marvellous. 38% of the daily calcium in every serve. Good thing I drink so much of this shit. (laughs) It's true, it's true. Here is a rather simpler example. 
Uh, this was stolen from a fact sheet from the Australian government. Um, the others were on the back of some food in my cupboard. Uh, and what you see here is fewer items in it, but you see only two columns. We'll get back to the uh, recommended daily intake, or RDI or DI, uh, in the future. But here we have a couple of basic things. We have energy, which is measured in kilojoules. That also interacts with metric, like that's how much energy you get from... Yeah, so joule is the standard unit of energy in um, metric. It is an amount of energy required to displace some mass by some amount. So I thought it's, it was a, to heat one milliliter. Of, that's the calorie. That's the calorie. Yeah, so oh, if you're right. American, you will see calories here, or kilocalories, so kilocalories or thousand calories. And a calorie is the amount of energy that it takes to heat one milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. Or Kelvin, it doesn't really matter which, that's right. the same. Kilojoules is the standard unit in metric now. Kil calories is also itself a metric unit, but it is because it is not stated in terms of fundamental physical properties... It's not considered the fundamental unit. Right. Oh, I'm glad I'm doing this podcast with you. Otherwise, I'd be completely fucking lost. <laughs> it's a good thing you're here. Mm. Listen to the day there's a Dean only episode. You, you. There's been a Dean only episode. It was the April Fool's episode. No, that was Dean presenting. Oh, I see. You two were there. There's a Dean only episode. We're just we're just going to listen to some really shitty, <laughs> like your songs I like off YouTube. That's basically going to be the whole thing. So it's just going to be a copyright violation. Yeah, but those videos are already copyright violations, so it's statute of limitation or whatever. <laughs> you put a disclaimer down the bottom, be like, this is second-hand copyright violation, yeah, so exactly. it's fine. <laughs> and steal it from somebody who owned it legitimately, I stole it from a thief. Yeah, exactly. In some ways, this is the this is truly legitimate because it's uh, been uh, reclaimed. <laughs> we can also see that we have protein uh, and fat, which gets broken up into, in this case, total fat and saturated fat. You may have heard of unsaturated fat. And uh, I'm guessing that there's some, it's like saturated with oxygen or whatever. Yeah, so it's about the chemical structure of the fat molecule. Yeah, basically. what it's been saturated by. Yeah, yeah. some have like a, a more complete construction, others do not. I can't remember the exact details. But if we come back here, we have saturated, trans, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated. Trans fats are something that I think is getting phased out of foods. I can't remember the exact chemical details, but you just don't see them. I think they were typically arising from added fats and oils, and I think that there were some potential health issues associated with high consumption of trans fats. Saturated fats, poly and monounsaturated fats, tend to be less processed than I think trans fats were. Mm. Polyunsaturated meaning there's multiple unsaturated points on the fat, and monounsaturated meaning there's like one. one. Yeah. Unsaturated point? Yeah. So Not that this is relevant, but it's... Well, no, the f food chemistry is interesting it and is also interesting. quite complex because, um, as we'll get to, it turns out that cooking changes things. Yeah, and also, taking a look at this, I don't see any of the microplastics. I need to know I'm getting my <laughs> daily dose of microplastics. Oh, well, for one thing, they don't measure it because it hasn't been required to measure it yet. And for two, are you sure you want to know? Yeah, I want to make sure I'm getting my recommended daily <laughs> intake. Uh, unfortunately, the recommended daily intake is zero. I don't believe that. Plastic, right, never degrade. So if I'm made mostly of plastic, I'll live forever. <laughs> we also have carbohydrate, which is broken into total and sugars. So carbohydrates are a broad class of stuff. They are comprised of different types of glucose stuck together. So glucose is what we call a monosaccharide. It's a single unit of a sugar. You stick multiple of these together and you get more complex sugars. So sucrose is two particular things of glucose stuck together. It's always interesting to talk to people who say carbohydrates and sugars like they're two different categories of thing. Yeah. So sucrose, uh, my organic chemistry is pretty trash. So glucose is approximately hexagonal. I guarantee you it's better than mine. <laughs> sucrose is what we call a disaccharide. So it's basically two of these stuck together. Disaccharide. I think uh, that character was in uh, Death Stranding. <laughs> like this. There are different types of glucose. So fiber is also itself a structure of these sugar compounds. It's just that it's one that we can't digest. So fiber is undigestible carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are digestible carbohydrates. Yet again, we lag behind the cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, there's there's room in here for another stomach. But I'm uh, just saying, <laughs> get on it. 
uh, New World Order. And so we separate out the total carbohydrates, which includes starches, which are more complex sugar molecules, from sugars, which are less complex sugar molecules. And basically, it takes more energy to take a chain of... Uh, I'm just going to draw it like this. So if yeah. your starch looks like... I don't know if they actually look like this. Yeah. But it looks like this, right? To get access to each of these bits, which is what your cells use to actually do sugar processing and, and generate energy from chemical processes, you have to break the whole molecule up. And breaking all of these bonds takes energy. Breaking is this, this why sugar with like our body has such a hyper happy response to sugar because like glucose because it's so fucking easy to get energy out of? Body's like, yeah, this shit. I yeah, love that. Pretty much. I mean, there's there is an evolutionary argument or sorry an argument for an evolutionary impetus towards really quite liking the taste of sugar for mm, humans fair enough least. yeah yeah so in the starches you have to break a lot of bonds to get at the individual bits of sugar in glucose on its own there are no bonds to be breaking you well not at least to get at the glucose molecule because there's just the one in sucrose and other like um i think fructose i can't remember if fructose is a, how many bits are in, but fructose is in the are. shampoo <laughs> yes because it's in fruit. Right, okay. Yeah. But why is it in my fucking shampoo? Because your shampoo probably contains some fruit stuffs. Huh. Yeah. All right, well, consider me educated. So the other part of this, which is not actually shown on these labels, is that within sugars in particular, naturally occurring... And Lovecraftian. <laughs> or added. So naturally occurring, you pick up an apple. That apple has a bunch of sucrose in it because it's a fruit. That is naturally occurring sugars. If you squish that apple and get the juice out, the juice has naturally occurring sugars. If you then add a couple of tablespoons of white sugar to that juice, it's you have much better. <laughs> you have added additional sugar. So one of the well, I don't know if it counts as a controversy, but one of the things that has come up in recent years about fruit juice, for example, is that a lot of bottled fruit juice that you get, particularly the shelf stable stuff, yeah, yeah, has a bunch of added sugar. Because they, they remix it from concentrates, which are often slightly bitter. Mm -hmm. Defeating It'll... the point of trying to have sucrose as opposed to just your fucking... Well, so so you get sucrose and fructose as added sugar. I mean, I think that white sugar is mostly sucrose. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, so... um. But what's the problem? It's the same shit. It's not entirely clear if it is fundamentally the same shit, right? Mm. Because if you have the sugar that occurs in an apple, it tends to be bound up in a whole bunch of other stuff. Whereas once you process sugar to extract it from sugar cane or beet or high fructose corn syrup or whatever, for one thing, you change the composition of the sugars in that substance and you also remove other stuff, which is potentially health benefit. Or diluting it at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honey is a really interesting one for this because raw or even just pasteurized honey, the sugars in it, you need a lot less honey to get the same effect of sweetness in flavoring mm. because the sugar molecules in it stick around on your tongue longer. Because it's sticky. <laughs> but it, part of the reason it's sticky is because these specific sugar molecules in honey, and there's a whole bunch of them and I don't understand a hell of a lot about it, some of them are more inclined to bind to the sweet taste receptors in your tongue for longer than right. glucose is. Speaking of which, I got that bit of honeycomb out in the kitchen. Yeah, you haven't been eating it. Oh, Well, it never goes bad. It's true. It's something I know about honey is... <laughs> it's definitely true, is that it never goes bad. And yeah, chewing up a bit of honeycomb without wax. It's like gum, but sugary. And it's it's from bees, so it can't be bad for you. Bee vomit is good. Yes. Yeah. And the last thing on this list, which I talked about fiber as undigestible forms of carbohydrate, is sodium. So sodium is typically from table salt, which is sodium chloride, N-A-C-L. It's that bit. Sodium is actually really important because it's one of the things that your nerves use to interact with each other. So if you have no sodium, you get nerve problems, basically. Your brain runs on this shit, the nerves in all the rest of your body run on sodium. So you do actually need some sodium in your diet. That's why uh, I go out to the big, in the field and lick the big cube of... Yeah, yeah, you, we have a salt lick for you at the back of the apartment block. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm seeing on this, we've got 
uh, there's protein, but that's good. That's good, right? But we've got fat, carbohydrates, and sodium. This thing that we're looking at must be very bad for you. <laughs> what is this thing? So uh, I don't know what this specific thing is. I just pulled it off of a um, fact sheet about such nutritional panels. But let's go back and have a look at these ones, right? Let's have a look at the um, prunes. First of all, average quantity quantity per serve or per 50 grams, which is what a serve is. You can see there's this amount of kilojoules. This. Well, I didn't know a gram weighed so much. Because <laughs> my average serve of prunes is like a good, good hefty handful. Yeah, well, this is one of the um, big potential issues is serving size and how that relates to what people actually eat. Yeah. So the serving size and this sort of thing is proposed by the manufacturer. I believe in Australia there are some standards. For example, fluids, standards usually 250 mil. Uh-huh. But you notice servings per package... 15 grams of sugar per 50 grams? Yeah. Per, yeah, yeah. So, well, actually, this column is what you, I would suggest you look at for this, right? So average quantity per 100 grams, roughly 100 mil. Oh, sorry, for, for the... for the um, This shit's 30% sugar. Yes. I thought this was good for me. Well, this is the natural sugars question, right? Because there's no added sugar in these. <laughs> 17% daily intake per fucking 50 grams of prunes. <laughs> well, I'm going to die young because <laughs> I'm not stopping. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the recommended daily intake again in a while. But it's always interesting to compare Australian and New Zealand ones. These are Australian New Zealand standard because they have the quantity per serving, percentage daily intake, which isn't always present, I think. For example, on this, it doesn't show up. Uh-huh. And the average quantity per... 100 grams. The average quantity per 100 grams makes it a lot easier to compare across foods because you can look at your dried prunes. I mean, look, each prune is basically equivalent of eating a plum, right? Fuck. <laughs> oh, you thinking, damn, healthy snack. <laughs> Have a little, little cupped hand of prunes. Yep. Mid afternoon. <laughs> Fart constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Till the next morning, just... Uh, I mean, look, it works, right? Tess is... Te- I'm editing. Tess editing has cut some out. I, I'm pruned up. <laughs> Maybe. But you can see that this allows you to have a much better idea of the actual physical behavior of a substance, right? Because you have a standardized amount, 100 grams, and you look down this, and you can convert these weights directly to a percentage. Yeah. So of your 100 grams, 3.6% is protein. 38.9% is carbohydrates. Of which that... Of, of, of that 38.9 grams, 31.2 grams is sugars. Yeah, yeah. You've got your... Di- now I remember why I don't look at these things. They just <laughs> depress me. Well, we'll talk about who actually reads them later on, right? But you, this average quantity per 100 grams makes it relatively straightforward to directly think about and conceptualize the actual composition of the food you're eating. Yes. If we come over to the oat milk, for example... Got to hit my... My macros and well, yeah, I've got to hit my things. Mm-hmm. There are people who eat like that. And listen, if you do that, I respect you. I just it's not you. It's not me. Yeah. So here, servings per package four, serving size two hundred fifty mils. You can see that we have a quantity per serving. We have the quantity per hundred mils. So if you have a solid food, it'll be per hundred grams. If you have a liquid, it'll be per mil, hundred mils. Right. And again, you can standardize this. The only thing that can be a little bit confusing is when you get down to milligrams. So a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. Yeah. And if I don't know if they actually have anything written in micrograms. So micrograms is that is the notation. So mu, sorry, mu m, mu g, right? Mm. Or which is um, one millionth of a gram. I so what milligram? So milligram is m g. That's one in one thousand. Mm-hmm. Uh, micrograms is one in one million. Okay, and micrograms is smaller because it has a capital M. That's not a capital M, that's the Greek letter mu. All right, I know uh, what mu looks like. <laughs> he's pink, uh, he's small, has a big bulbous tail thing. It's kind of got a tail thing down here. It looks like an M. It looks it like it is the Greek letter M, yes, but it's called mu. All right. I, I think the e, if you're writing it in um, Latin letters, it might be M. C, G, micrograms? I can't remember. I'm a statistician. I use mu all the time. But we see that when it comes to like sodium and calcium, these things are measured in micrograms, not grams, right? So units matter. Yeah. Because this is a thousand times as, 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 you know, a thousand times smaller than a gram. Is that mu or an M? That's an M because these are milligrams. Right. Micrograms 
use the drink ladder. At the point where it's micrograms, don't put it on the packet. It's not relevant. Ah, uh, well, it depends, right? In particular, with stuff that's um, health claims and health foods and things, there are some substances where micrograms matter. For example, if you're lacing with your food with LSD, you care about the micrograms. And also, microplastics. If you're counting fucking micrograms, you can tell me the microplastics that are in there. Measuring them is hard. Uh, I mean... Uh, well, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> we don't actually have standards for them. Anyway, I, th- I suspect, give it 20 years and there probably will be, because everyone will be shitting themselves in panic over the what's actually happening with those. I'm convinced this is like the, the lead the lead poisoning of our, of our society. You know, why, why are people going crazy? I mean, A, uh, the contradictions. <laughs> the, old, uh, the old rate of the profit continuing to decline. But yeah. also... I think we all have plastic madness. I think we've all got long COVID plastic madness. <laughs> Another thing to consider is when people make, cl- well, sorry, when companies make claims about things like being some percentage fat free, this has 1.2 grams of fat per 100 grams, which means it is 98.8% fat free. That's good for you, right? Totally. Here's the thing, right? You, you you have said this to me before when you're like, oh, look at that. It says like 96% fat free. That's 4% fat. I go, huh. That's true. They are representing in a different way. But fundamentally, I don't know how much f- fat in a thing is bad. Well, yeah. I mean, this is one of the one of the issues with this, right? Is that this- if they say ninety eight point eight percent fat free, that suggests to me, and I know it's marketing. I'm just saying what my brain like feels yeah, yeah. that one point two grams of fat per hundred grams can't be that bad. Well, okay, if it's say ninety five percent fat free. And it's an ice cream versus, I don't know, a 90% fat-free ice cream, right? So one's 5% fat, one's 10% fat. Yeah, yeah. That's a fair enough comparison to make. But both of those are trying to use that to make them seem, quote-unquote, healthier than they are. Because you hear 90 or 95% fat-free, you think, wow, that's really low in fat. Because 95% of it has no fat in it. But that's not what it's actually saying. And I, I have a deep hatred for that sort of marketing because people read that and they don't interpret it as, well, that just means the rest of it's fat. They interpret it as, oh, 95% of this has zero fat in it, which is not the same. Yeah, I kind of... Nobody thinks that, surely. I did before I actually sat down and thought about it. Oh, maybe I'm too dumb. (laughs) I just thought, okay, then the other bit's got to be fat, right? But, I I mean, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you think that, then you will indeed be duped. Well, I think a lot of this, you see it less now because I think people have wised up to it. Right. But also um, now there's the, the low fat craze of the early 2000s and late 90s somewhat fell off when people realized, huh, there's all this sugar in this stuff. Oh, yeah, no, we've got plastic madness. <laughs> and sugar madness. We've got long COVID and also sugar madness. So much of this, right, is, um, and we'll talk more about this later when we get into the ideology of it, but... It is one thing to present this information as factual information and factual statements. It is another thing to present claims and marketing like 98.8% fat-free or talk about percentage daily intake, which we will get to because I have some issues with this. This is factual information. The rest is normative, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. There's no... Like, so what if... You know how I was just discussing that I don't really know what is and isn't healthy. Yeah. I mean, there could be some ideology in the fact that we're happy to say this thing is eleven. This thing is twelve percent sugar, and we live in a society that doesn't make them put a fucking biohazard warning on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so much of it also comes down to like, well, the material conditions of who's eating it, because it turns out healthy food is often expensive or takes time and resources to make. Yeah. Yeah. There's. There are some material conditions going on in this economy we live in. Precisely. You know, a, a, a tasty like a fast food treat for one evening is, you know, something that somebody has and it's a little bit of an indulgence. But if you're in an economic situation where that's all you can eat, then the relative nutritional deficit that that comes at is it's going to end up being fucking bad for you. So let's have a look at how these numbers are calculated. Then we'll come back and talk about the recommended intake stuff. Various governments have done the research to work out typical composition for base ingredients. So we're going to look at an invented example. But if you're making a product to sell, you'll usually put a whole bunch of ingredients in, like raw ingredients, do some processing or some cooking, and then get your product out at the end. Mm -hmm. And if you have an understanding of what goes into the original ingredients, you can estimate what comes out in the end product. Unless chemistry happens. Well, we have some ways to look at how the chemistry happens and when. 
Okay. Yeah, so we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, I mean, for example, the um, US government has done a bunch of research in the Department of Agriculture looking at taking a raw product, testing how much stuff is in it, then cooking it in some way and looking at the relative composition of the product at the other end. Yeah, the ratchet is far more (laughs) flavourful after it's been... Oh, yes, it gets a little bit piquant, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So in Australia and New Zealand, these sorts of calculations are done with a combination of different data sets. For example, the USDA database on this sort of... These standards is used. We also have the New Zealand Institute of Plant and Food Research, various researchers in Australia who do their own stuff, particularly for native foods. And we also use the Danish Food Composition Data Bank. So these are basically governments who have sat down, done a bunch of testing on different products and got standards. We expect there to be some variation season to season, product to product, but it's usually pretty solid and they do update them over time. So let's have a look at an example. I'm going to be making a kind of boring cake. The ingredients are 400 grams of plain flour, 200 grams unsalted butter. It is boring, not even salted. Yeah. Three eggs. Okay, now we're talking. Which is, I'm going to say is approximately 150 grams raw whole egg. Damn, you wrote out the whole recipe. I did. 200 grams of white sugar. Ooh, okay. Not Uh so boring now. (laughs) Well, it is a cake. And 250 gram mil, sorry, of full cream milk. Okay. Okay. Look, the first half, not so exciting. You have pulled it back as we get into the latter half of this little ensemble. So for each of these ingredients, we will have information on the standard com- nutritional composition of those. So let's have a look at the flour. Here is the US... <laughs> The USDA standards for unbleached, unenriched plain wheat flour. You can see, and raw, by the way, so this hasn't been cooked yet. It's just... Ash. Yes. The fuck is there ash in the flour? Processing. Look, this is just what they write down, right? So this is... Again, I I, I want to note some ideology maybe you haven't seen, is that I know there's ratchet in there. (laughs) I know that rodent's poop makes it into my mouth, which means it's somewhere in here. The uh, acceptable contamination parameters were not included in this table. Noted, okay. But listener, if you want to never eat happily again, go ahead and look those up. (laughs) Ratchet's... It's, it's low down on the list of things that disturb me. Mm. This is the US website. Notice these are metric units. Uh-huh. Here we have our micrograms. Ooh, selenium. Selenium, molybdenum, molybdenum. I can never remember how to pronounce that. But you've got a whole bunch of trace minerals in your um, flour. Here are vitamin and other components. And here are, like, water. I'm not entirely sure what outwater general and outwater specific factors are. Didn't look that up, sorry. You have your protein, again, per 100 grams, so roughly 12% protein, Mm -hmm. fat, and so ash, indeed. And so carbohydrate by difference, I think that is looking at the difference between the, like, nutritionally available carbohydrate and the fiber, or it might be everything, and then elsewhere you will have this more broken up. But this is the sort of information that you get, and the things that we would care about would probably be some combination of these... Protein, fat, carbohydrates, fiber, depend uh, sodium. Depending on the health claims, you may care about these guys, and potentially vitamin. Depending on health claims, these are. Too- I must stress that I care about how much ash is in my. <laughs> I, I really can't let this go. That <laughs> we're just going to ignore the fact that there's ash in there. Oh look, it's it's only like zero point five percent. It's 99.95% ash free. Uh, 99.4. Sorry. Yeah, 99.45% ash free. 44. 44, yeah. Ash free. Okay, I feel better about it now that you've put it like that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Okay. So once we have these for each of our particular ingredients, we multiply them out. So we have 400 grams of plain flour. So each of these average amounts, we would multiply by four to understand how much is going into our recipe. Thankfully, I am not going to make you sit through me doing that boring shit arithmetic. I'm going to use the Australian food, Australian and New Zealand food standards calculator to do it for me. Oh, neato. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically a website tool. You go in there, you, you search the ingredients. You can add custom ingredients if you want, which I did not fuck around with. And then it does all the calculations for you. I think that these are slightly different standards to these ones. I'm not sure where the overlap is between what's been Mm -hmm. measured here and what's been measured in the US, 
but you get the idea, right? 400 grams of wheat flour plain gives you in total this amount. Okay, can we see? Oh, then totals down the bottom there. This is total per 100 grams. Mm-hmm. This will be more than 100 grams of stuff. No, I follow. Yeah. yeah. So first thing you do... How can the total per 100 grams be higher than actually, any of the individual components? Um. Oh, so I think... Oh, that's not per 100 grams. That's no, this is, li- this is... Talk about user interface problems. This is badly set up. One column to look at here is what's called specific gravity. This is a comparison of the density of your fluid to water. So basically, if your fluid is more dense than water, the specific gravity will be higher, I think. If your fluid is less dense than water, I think the specific gravity is lower. It may be the inverse of that. I can't remember off the top of my head. But basically, if you dissolve a whole bunch of stuff in your fluid, in your water, you wind up with denser fluid. Right. Yeah, and you have to account for that to convert your milliliter measurement into a, gra- a mass measurement. Welcome, Mango the cat, to the podcast, everyone. He is now walking all over my desk and getting himself in the way. Uh, the other side of this table, you see here, these are the components that will go on the um, label, nutritional label. Mm-hmm. Cat, do not, do not eat my prune. Yeah, do you know how much sugar's in that, buddy? So these cat needs to read the fucking label. These are the components that will go into the nutritional label. With this handy dandy tool, you put the ingredients in, then you come down to this recipe weights. It calculates the initial weight for you based on what you've put in it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you give it a final weight. So the final weight is imagine that you've stuck this in the oven and cooked it. What is the mass of the thing you get out? Right. Typically for baked goods, you expect it to lose mass. Yeah. I'm sure that there are other foods that gain mass. I don't know what they would be, but... Pasta. No. Dry pasta. True, yes. It does absorb water. Yeah. Pasta is an interesting one because you actually lose starch to the water you cook it in. Mm, mm. So um, this is where th- there are more complex calculations that this ca- which can look at individual ingredients, individual components, and actually do that sort of analysis to say, here is the dry or here is the raw components. We cook it in the way you typically would. Here's what comes out. What changes? Okay. No, I, follow, I follow what we're seeing here. I don't think that this particular tool does it. I think that this tool assumes that the proportion of nutrients doesn't change between the raw ingredients and the final ones. Yeah, where so you might actually shed various... Yeah, or also... So the sorts of things that I'm thinking about are, like, um, if you burn something... Then you the get car- ash. You get ash. But also the carbohydrate content reduces because you've basically burned those carbohydrates and turned them into something that's undigestible, or at least no longer sugars. Yeah, as chemistry happens, bits turn into gas and fly off and all sorts of shit. Yeah. So other stuff like proteins, when you heat up proteins, your egg white goes hard, right? It goes rubbery. So that is if a... If you cook it too much, yeah. <laughs> so that is a change in the protein structure. But what we actually use proteins for, which are individual components called amino acids, are still there. So you're not actually reducing the amount of quote-unquote protein that you get out. It's just in a slightly different shape. Yeah, but we, we, we understand that you add a bunch of heat and mix things together, chemistry happens, some stuff might fly off. Some stuff might <laughs> mutate. fly in. Yeah. Or mutate, yeah. Although, really got to, again... This is, okay, I'm a fat bastard. Yeah. We understand this. Go to the next slide. I don't care who you are. You're not just having 150 grams of cake. <laughs> so, here I have put in a serving size, and I've said, well, I've got 900 grams. 900 grams divided by 150 is... Is it six? Yes. Yes, it's six. I did this arithmetic in my head, and I'm bad at that. Each of these boring cakes produces six servings of 150 grams after cooking. Serving size is a contentious issue because in the US, for example, I think that there is a lot more freedom for um, companies to determine the serving size. Mm-hmm. And if you if you have like a bag of chips, right, and your serving size is supposed to be a handful of chips. Yeah, that doesn't reflect how people that doesn't eat. Re- yeah, yeah. And so, so one of the big things in the US is that there is this fuckery with serving size, but they also don't have this standardized per 100 gram per 100 mil column. So yeah. all you get 
is the information based on the serving size that the company has decided, which may or may not reflect how you actually eat the thing. Yeah, like sleeve of Oreos. Yeah. Which some people just consume as the serving. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is broadly a problem where the labeling and the, I guess, food industry has um, perverse incentives with regard to giving people information on what they are actually eating. Okay, I see other statistics in this. <laughs> and ideology, perhaps? Well, no, we'll, we'll get there. I <laughs> Have a quite tweaked on as a real ideology. Okay, so if we come back here, we've put in our raw ingredients, we've said how much does the final product weigh. This weight change is a uh, percentage based, so I think it would be so it'll be the final minus the initial uh, divided by one of the two. Let's not get too. I'm not going to worry about it, but basically you're looking. It's negative. And I have a smaller number for the final weight, so it'll be the final minus the initial. And then there's some comparison which gives you basically a percentage change, right? Yeah, 300 grams is about right for... Yeah, for... it is in fact 25%. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So from here, I get my boring cake nutritional information panel. Hey, what? that's the stuff we saw on that other label. That is the stuff we saw on that other label. That shit was cake. Oh, it was bad for you. <laughs> I don't think... Well, it... all right. No, then. I don't think it was... Hang on, let's go and have a look. No, I wasn't even remotely close to this. But it's the same stuff. Yeah, but in a different... This is more carbs. Uh, less total. More, I think, more carbohydrates per 100 grams. It might be bread. Yeah, probably. But you can see here... Also bad for you. <laughs> We're not going to moralise about the actual components of food. I No, I, I, I definitely think we should assign... Moral weight to... <laughs> not only moral, but spiritual weight. Mm. I had really good bread this morning for breakfast, actually. Mm, pretty good. So you can see how we get the average quantity per serving and the average quantity per 100 grams. Yeah, imagine somebody giving a fucking loaf of bread an exorcism. <laughs> it turns out it was the body of Satan, not the body of Christ. No, I, well, look, I'm not the first person to say that there's something like religious going on with raised yeast. I think, I hope that you have a much better understanding of where these numbers come from. Now we're going to talk about the uh, moralizing aspect because we haven't mentioned the recommended daily intake. Which, straight off the top of my head, this is for somebody of a particular size and shape mm. with a particular lifestyle uh, who has particular normal needs, potentially not IBS or... Well, yeah, so this is based off of a healthy person, uh, non-gender, despite the fact that there are gender differences broadly defined. And importantly, they are looking at people whose BMI, and boy, you know already I'm going to love this. Yeah, yeah. Is 22 point something? 22.0, yes. So these are normative statements. Yeah, and it's problematic because it's not like if you just ate the daily intake, you would just adjust to be whatever size that yeah. they think you should be. You actually do need to maintain your body. Like, starving yourself does not actually... See our episode on BMI. several different subjects about why that yeah. just does How fat doesn't are work. we? Yeah. Yeah. So normal, quote-unquote, normal, healthy at all. And I have no doubt right. that the person they use as the template is probably is healthy and typical. Well, they don't even use a person. It's a population-based thing. I guess if you yeah. had somebody who met these particular details, they are likely to be healthy, but... Are they normal? That's why I said... Yeah, know. yeah, Well, I mean, so much of, of this is normative in the sense that there is a very large diversity of needs for individual bodies, even bodies of the same size and composition. Metabolism is very hugely across even a human lifetime. I mean, between people is another thing entirely. Yeah, do you have endometriosis and you need iron because your body is... Constantly destroying itself. Yeah, bleeding out every... Or humans. also, like, the meta base metabolic rate of somebody's body varies a lot. And one of the things that isn't taken into account with these RDI statistics or even just recommended dietary stuff is that people who have done a lot of really, like, calorie-restrictive dieting and crash dieting and that sort of thing, any instances where you are starving your body, your body will tend to change its base metabolic rate, how fast it uses energy and how much energy it uses to survive when you're not doing anything. Activity changes your metabolic rate because you require a certain amount of energy available to move yourself. Yeah, you get hungry after you do exercise. But what typically happens if you basically starve yourself to lose, let's say, half your body weight, is that your body becomes much more efficient in terms of your base resting metabolic rate, and so you don't need as much energy in order to just maintain a steady weight, which is why you typically see people... They'll have an initial large drop, and then 
their quote unquote progress towards their weight goal will plateau because they are their body is adapting to the restriction and becoming more efficient. This doesn't see me going from one twenty to one hundred kilos. Yeah, uh, inside of a very short span of time, not being super aggressive, and then being unable to hit ninety nine for like six eight weeks. Yeah. Because I just wouldn't fucking... But he's like, this this line we shall not cross. <laughs> and even beyond that, at some point, like because it turns out that starving yourself is fundamentally unmanageable in the long term, as soon as you stop eating such a calorie-restricted diet, your body immediately goes, oh, thank fuck, quick, pack on as much as we can, because fuck knows when this will happen again. So what you wind up with is people who lose or drop a lot of weight are unable to maintain that because it's physically impossible to do, start eating a normal diet again and suddenly their weight goes up, may even surpass what they were at previously, but their metabolism never actually goes back to the original functioning. This is particularly observable with people who have been on those programs like, I hate it so much, The Biggest Loser, mm. where they, you do see people drop a lot of their, a huge percentage of their body weight and their metabolism never recovers. Or, another way to look at it, silver linings. They're just so much more efficient now. Except that they can't actually do anything because their efficiency is for the base metabolic rate. They still need the same amount of energy to do other activities, but they can't necessarily get to that without eating too much and having other problems, right? So you But wonder... consider how well they do if they're on the next season of Survivor. <laughs> You went from one reality show to the other, huh? I'm seeing, I'm seeing like a I'm training I'm sure that'd be so them. healthy for them. <laughs> Should be shitty. And it is interesting. I mean, we're talking about weight loss stuff and everything, but to go back to sort of our topic of conversation, uh, here's the ideology creeping in. You have the food industry, which I don't think it's a controversial to statement to say contributes greatly to the rate of health problems, health problems and obesity. I uh, hope we want to sort of talk about them, that in relation. The point is. The food that we are presented as a society results, you are what you eat. These industries and standard agencies go ahead and serve to us the food which we have available and then uh, has the audacity to say, uh, but actually you're eating too much of it. <laughs> there is, uh, I think, a little bit of cheek going on. Well, I mean, it's it's all about the individual responsibility ideology, right? That's right. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that this isn't necessarily like... <laughs> there are no individual solutions to systemic problems, yes. Right. And it's not as though this, this recommended daily intake is necessarily wrong. I'm sure the person who put it together is well-meaning. But in the context of the presentation of, I mean, places that just live in absolute food deserts. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not the fucking answer. Because all of this RDI stuff is based on, like, nudge theory, which is basically this dog shit idea that if you offer people information and incentives to do stuff change nothing about the actual material conditions of their choices yeah yeah they will somehow make better according to this liberalism i suppose choices about their lives right whereas if you live in and if it, listen if you don't know what a food desert is if you just heard that phrase let me give you an example when we were living in the uk i hadn't eaten fresh fruit in like three weeks and that's not true i was buying fresh fruit all the time you just weren't eating it i hadn't had good fruit okay yeah <laughs> in, so i went to the local supermarket and went to the fruit section and found out that there, the reason for that was there, there was no fruit there was no good fruit. There was what they alleged was a mango. <laughs> okay, look, eating mangoes in the UK is just asking for pain, to be honest. I mean, apples are all right. But that's what, yeah. what I'm saying, right, is that is yeah, that yeah. if you want to talk about the reality of living in a food desert, it's that you can be in an environment where because of the the market forces, it's, it's literally not practical for you to get a hold of the food that would make up a nutritionally balanced diet. So the best examples of these in Australia are actually remote indigenous communities. Yeah, for... for you literally are, well, for one thing, you're often in a desert. Yes, but also, if there is a local store, it'll be, the, the fresh produce will be either non-existent or crap and stupidly expensive. If you're living out there, chances are you're not particularly wealthy anyway, so your your opportunities to actually afford to eat healthily are basically none. And again, that's why I mentioned people who end up relying on fast food, because it, it's just giving you kilojoules and calories that keep you going through the day. Yes. But you end up having to eat a lot of it just to get your fucking, what Say, they call or, it? or to become satiated. Yeah. Because it turns out feeling hungry sucks. I, I realize that this may be a surprise <laughs> to some, but the, the physiological experience of being hungry all the time is immensely bad for your brain. Yeah, people who say, dude, it's just a matter of willpower. It's like, buddy, you've evolved <laughs> basically to be a mouth. <laughs> yes, it's true. We're all, we're all a support system for a stomach. 
So I do want stomach to... and reproductive organs. Yeah. So I do want to talk about this a bit more because there are some interesting features to it. For a lot of stuff, it is a lower bound. Also, oh, they're they're hedging their bets here. Yeah. So now you feel guilty if it turns out that. So, for example, the calcium, the the calcium RDI is basically a minimum to sustain healthy function. So the recommended daily intake for a person of this size. It's basically, you need to be getting at least this much in order to maintain bone density, whatever else. Else For energy, it's a higher estimate. The The logic here is that, well, if, if you put a lower bound on the energy intake, then people will just eat too much. As if people are actually reading this stuff and making those kind of calculations. I certainly got to the point of, the one point I was quite interested in, daily intake and kilojoules and whatnot... But again, like anything with weight or, or intake or nutrition, there's so many caveats about what is written that it, it functionally becomes meaningless. Yeah, well, so much of this, because this these normative statistics are based on, I think particularly for energy, is based on what's called a desirable estimated energy requirement, which is targeted at healthy activity level among healthy people, meaning 22 BMI and the recommended amount of exercise, right? Yeah. But that changes as soon as your body is even slightly different. And even within that group, there will be a large variation in the actual amount of energy required to maintain that lifestyle. Yeah, it's very difficult to be on a diet as a an overweight... Well, again, the use of the word overweight. As, as a fat person. As a fat person. Fat when I go to the gym frequently. Yeah. It's very difficult to do a caloric restriction when you're hauling more than 100 kilos of guy into the gym, not as frequently as I'd like recently, but I, when I do go fairly frequently, and then you have to put a lot of food into that body to keep it going while also trying to manage, yeah. I don't know, some some idea of some kind of diet to, to assist your attempting to, to make a weight category. Yeah. So there is what's called the estimated... You read that E very oddly. Listen, I'm writing if you think that E is weird there. That, that E too. All your E's, E's are weird. For maintenance? Let's just mock this person. Given that my handwriting is more legible than yours, I don't think you have a leg to stand on. Your E's are fucked up. The estimated energy requirement for maintenance is basically how much energy your body needs to maintain your current level of activity and your current body composition. Compare that to the desirable estimated energy requirement, which is the normative bit, which is the one that you get told, oh, you're too fat, you need to eat this much less a day or whatever. Mm -hmm. Very, very few people will actually know their estimated requirement for maintenance because that's difficult to calculate. I don't know what physiological tests are required to do that, but because there is so much variation across so many different people, it's something that you need to test quite rigorously in order to understand. Which makes it, of course, stupider and much harder to have these single statistics for each nutrient. So if we go back to this example, right? These percent daily intakes, these are based on this ungendered person of indeterminate age, adult, what does that mean, with a BMI of 22. That's basically meaningless to anybody who's actually looking to calculate this stuff directly. If you are somebody who is... For example, um, reading this stuff because you're a bodybuilder and you want to make sure you're getting enough protein and blah, 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 blah. You will look at the average quantity per 100 grams and calculate how much of that you are getting. Yeah. You're not going to look at the percentage daily intake. And also, if you are somebody who has a particular like nutritional need, like iron, if you're iron deficient. Yeah. Question. Or if you're iron sensitive, if that's not listed here, are you to assume there is none? That's the hard part. So a lot of this stuff... Minerals like iron are often only explicitly mentioned when there is a specific health claim related to them. So in some cereals, for example, so I'm pretty sure that like Nutrigrain lists a whole bunch of minerals that it includes explicitly because it makes claims about being the, the breakfast cereal you need if you're going to the gym or whatever else. Fuck, I haven't nutri- had Nutrigrain in like a decade. Like a gold bowl of Nutrigrain. <laughs> <laughs> I might get a, one of those little little mini boxes of Nutrigrain. <laughs> Treat myself. Let's go to the gym tomorrow. Maybe I'll start the day with a bowl of Nutrigrain. This is an official product endorsement of Nutrigrain by the podcast. <laughs> statistically insignificant. That's it. So sorry, statistically indistinct. To uh, that. Yes, my bad. Okay. So one additional pathology that I have particular problem with is kilojoule labeling. That's spoilers on fast food. The logic here is basically that it is factual information. Fine. But to put it on fast food menus is intended to be that nudge stuff, right? So you or me, the fat person, is meant to look at the kilojoule amount associated with a particular meal and go, 
oh, that's really high. Maybe I'll go for something smaller. But the reality is people don't do that. (laughs) Or at least they may have when this shit was initially introduced. But exposure means people just ignore it now. Yeah, and I don't eat fast food often enough to... I don't think of my food in terms of kilojoule intake. Yes, and I mean, there is a whole question about how, and I should have mentioned this earlier perhaps, how the calculated available energy in a foodstuff actually translates to what is biologically available. Because in order for some food, let's say you eat you eat a teaspoon of sugar, right? So that's basically pure sucrose, mm-hmm. right? You eat it, that is, I don't know, five grams of sucrose, right? your body probably isn't going to put all five grams of that sucrose into your bloodstream. In your gut, how that actually happens is that those molecules literally have to pass through the wall of your intestine Mm -hmm. to pass into your bloodstream, which is when they get used. Everything else gets shut out at the end. There is also in the liver, which processes a lot of the blood, will filter out sugars and things. I think one of the signs of being diabetic is having sugar in your urine. I can't remember exactly, but basically... Mine has been tasting sweet lately. (laughs) But the idea here, right... That's a joke, listener. Mine tastes normal. Mine, my piss tastes completely normal. (laughs) I'm perfectly healthy. The underlying idea here, right, is that we don't really understand how much of a, a... How much of the actual energy that is theoretically available in a foodstuff translates to energy that is actually processed by your body at a cellular level. And it may differ depending on where the energy comes from. Where we were talking earlier about the different structures of sugars and how complex sugar structures and starch and things are less energy available than simple sugars, that is actually relevant here because if you have a bunch of complex sugars and simple sugars in your food, the kilojoule availability may be very, very different from the kilojoule content because some of those may be more readily able to pass into the blood in your gut than others. And this might be me talking out of my um, digestive tract, but uh, (laughs) my understanding is that if your gut flora is not set up to be particularly efficient at a a certain meal, you might absorb even less. Yeah, we don't know a hell of a lot about that stuff, so this is very much an open area of research at the moment. What am I doing all these colonoscopies for, then? Uh, That's to see if you have even bigger bugs. I see. Yeah. Fair enough. So, So this is an active area of research. But when it comes to kilojoule label on on fast food, that's basically just there to bully fat people. But the side effect of this is that the people who are most likely to be directly impacted by that labeling and the, the prominence, shall we say, that is given is people who already have a tendency to do towards disordered eating. Yeah. This is kind of the uh, last thing that I wanted to talk about, is who reads this stuff anyway? Oh, yeah, I'm just like hypochondriacs, people with, you know, societally created body dysmorphia. you got your fucking anorexics, other eating disorders. It's kind of funny to look at the research for this stuff, right? Because the vast majority of people do not read it. And this is something that governments panic about because they're like, but you have to know, you have to know so you can make healthy choices in your diet. This would be like if there was a whole bunch of signage related to voices in your head. <laughs> and it's like, I wonder who is actually reading this. It turns out it's the people who uh, were perhaps not helped mm. by the presence of a whole bunch of signs about voices in your head. So particularly when it comes to the kilojoule labeling on fast food menus. Listen, so- if voices in your head is a problematic statement, it occurred to me it might be. Uh, I'm saying it in good faith, I promise. I will not look it up to find out I care only enough to offer a disclaimer. (laughs) I'm not that good of a person. So I think there is a difference here between nutritional labeling on food packaging and kilojoule labeling on fast food restaurant menus. So the nutritional labeling on food packaging is there as information. You can go and look at it if you want to. On a fast food menu, it is there specifically so you see it whether or not you want to. And those are fundamentally different things. The people who typically read this stuff are people who are counting calories and their macronutrients. That may be people with some form of disordered eating, whether it's some sort of anorexia or body dysmorphia, or even what's known as orthorexia, which is basically a form of disordered eating which is grounded in correctness. It's, it's a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. I, know, I don't know if it has been formally transcribed in the diagnostic manual or whatever else, but the framework is basically that it is an obsession to eat only correct, quote unquote, or only good foods. Fuck, I've been there. Yeah, and this becomes pathological once you start obsessing over it. Because there's a difference between saying, 
well, I know that healthy eating looks like getting more fresh fruit and vegetables and fewer processed foods. I will try to aim towards that and saying, okay, I'm going to spend 20 minutes reading this nutritional information panel and plotting out every aspect of this meal in order to make sure that I'm doing the correct thing with regards to a diet. Society is trying to get you to do that. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that um, the people on maintenance phase talk about, Audrey in particular on maintenance phase, talks about how Weight Watchers, which she was put into as a teenager, basically trained her to have an eating disorder because it taught her to count calories, it taught her to obsessively read this stuff and compare what she was eating to what she quote-unquote should and all this sort of stuff. And it's just a recipe for disordered eating. I see this so much in the case of the fast food stuff because it is already very, very hard for people with those kinds of eating disorders to eat in public because that is a great way to give themselves anxiety and then to have something there that is a, a very, very obvious reminder of these sorts of frameworks. Yeah. It doesn't help. Well, and specifically, it's not like it's terrible to try and have an idea about the mechanics of what you are consuming, but the presentation of these as authoritative stats, when in fact, what is far more important is an understanding of yourself and your body. And especially when the presence of those things is meant to be a shaming tactic. Yeah, it's they're pathology. Not, yeah, they're not actually helping anyone make better decisions about food. Because what happens if you're a fat... Per- See, here's the thing. Skinny people, if you take fat people out to a restaurant and uh, you order an entree and then um, you wait for the fat person to eat the thing first, fuck you. <laughs> because the fat person does never wants to be seen as the one reaching for the food first. It's just not a good look. And you develop a fucking pathology about it like I have. And yet, look at you and they go, fucking, you have some if you want. It's like, you have some if you want. <laughs> you prick. I am eternally so relieved that I managed some I honestly don't know how I managed to have my ego I suppose my self-confidence get past that stuff I mean it was quite a battle in my younger years but now I do not care about being the fat person ordering dessert at a restaurant and it's not I don't think I have a problem with my body no but you have a problem with the way other people look at you in public when you are the fat person ordering dessert because right it's, it's intrusive and it's rude or being the first person to reach for the pizza when it arrives and it's yeah. like I know that ideas about that are around and so even though I don't particularly care I do know that other people do and that you know influences behavior so yeah so I'm just writing one what I'm saying is if you're skinny eat first save <laughs> the fat person some anxiety because we want to be fucking eating first <laughs> I want that slice of pizza! So one last note on on this bit is that available info is not the same as pushing info. So having the, on like the McDonald's website, having somewhere you can go and look up what the nutritional composition of your Big Mac is, is not the same as writing on the menu the kilojoule content. And that they are both practically and ideologically different structures. I have one last statistic that I want to show you, which is the health star rating. So these are something that Australia does. One of the weirdest mechanics ever put in a Mario game, but I'm starting (laughs) to like it. Okay, are we pro or against the health star rating? Um, they're, They're complicated. So the idea of these is that they are a way to compare similar products. Hang on a moment. Yeah. Sorry, just go back to regular view there. That thing's got zero kilojoules, zero saturated fat, zero sugar, zero sodium, zero nutrient, and it's only a 3.5 health star? <laughs> this shit's stringent. Right, so if I want to get uh, a packet of biscuits, you and can... I'm thinking, oh, I'd like to make a more healthy choice, I'm getting a packet of biscuits, but I might get the five-star packet of biscuits. Yeah, and so, so the idea being that basically they are a tool for comparing like with like. So biscuits with biscuits, yogurt with yogurt, juice with juice, whatever. Right? Ratchet to ratchet. Ratchet to ratchet. Um, ash. Um, <laughs> ratchet to ratchet and ash to ash. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want five-star ash. I want five-star rodent poo. And in that respect, they are an ordered statistic. They are something that is... I mean, the calculation process for these is exhaustive. I went and had a look. I'm not going to tell you much about it, but it is intense. And basically, there is a different framework for each food type, and there are revisions to those frameworks as research improves. That seems like a better way of doing things. Well, this is where we run into the problems, right? Because... No, it's bad. I hate when I go, that looks okay, and then Tess gives a little... <laughs> Sigh. Okay, so the good features are that if you are comparing like with like, there is a consistent standard that you can use. It is easy to interpret in the sense that more stars is more healthy. More gooder. 
Those are the those are the positives that I identified. Yeah, yeah. The the big thing is if you are comparing like with like. Right. And that is a a big problem because when people see these, that may not be what they're doing. So right. if you're comparing yogurt brand A with yogurt brand B, that's a choice you can make. But if you're comparing yogurt brand A with biscuit brand B, mm-hmm. that those are not a direct comparison because those are not like products. Is this a matter of sort of of education or labeling? I, I think it's really fraught because once again, this is a nudge based system. It is a a system that assumes that if you give people the information, then they will have the material conditions to make a better choice. Right. Well, or, well, you'll they'll have the information to make the better choice. But yeah, but also. But hang on. Yeah. As you just said, it's nudge if people have the information. But as you just pointed out, there's a fundamental... I didn't understand it was for comparing like products before. You yes, exactly. So as a means of providing people with information, it's failed right out of the gate because people don't know how to use it. Yes. So there there are efforts to give better education, particularly like... I mean, this is something that you could teach kids in high school. You show them this sort of stuff in a, in a chemistry subject or biology or, or, or even food science or PE or whatever. You can do this stuff. It's not that hard. I think the problem is that there are other structural issues with this. So some pathologies include the fact that it is optional to display, Hmm. which means, of course, there is a massive bias towards only higher rating products actually producing this because you're not going to put 0.5 stars on your candy bar. That's true. But then at that point you go, okay, they, they've got the fucking mystery mark. Yeah. But people don't think that way. Right. Like, again, we just, this is what we need to put on billboards instead of stupid shit. <laughs> Public education campaign. I am getting a t-shirt with all of this information, very densely packed on it. <laughs> Please do. I'd love to see it. And I'm standing in a public place, thrusting my tits at people, (laughs) making him read. This is also a normative construction. And one of the things that has been proposed to change in the last, I think, three, four years is that the way that the original framework for these are built is that they heavily punish the presence of fats, but added sugar is relatively uncompromising. So you can have your shelf-stable juice with a lot of added sugar will still get a high health rating because it's juice. Yeah. Uh, it's fruit juice. It's fruit. Yeah, even if that is... I hate to use the term less healthy because I think it's a bad thing to say about two completely different foods. Even if that is comparatively less healthy than a bread, like let's say wholemeal uh, sourdough or something, right? So relatively, quote unquote, healthy so, sort of bread, right? The like with like comparison, the fact that it is not structured to reflect the the components, I think, in a, in a particularly great way, means that there are pathologies to this rating which are difficult to account for in its use. So I think that these are frustrating. I think that the money that goes into this sort of thing would be much better spent, for example, just directly providing people with better food. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, hang on. Hang on. I know. I'm not going to launch into a fucking criticism of the... Of the liberal state, but you know that's not in the realm of possibility. <laughs> yes, but like you could do so much more good with just directly providing. Fuck it, give kids meals in schools that are healthy and enjoyable for them to eat. It's doable. Yeah, you know, make it free. Fuck it, whatever. Spend the money on that. That would do so much more good for public health than any amount of money poured into this campaign. Subsidize people to visit nutritionists if you want them to have more personalized health knowledge. Yeah, but even then, that is still that's not a systemic answer because it's one thing to go to a nutritionist and be told here's how you should eat. It's another thing to have the time and resources available to do that. Right, that's true. I'm I'm thinking about that in the context of a, of a more utopian. Yeah, certainly the healthcare system should be free at the point of use. Indeed. All right, that is everything for today. We are over an hour and I have a meeting to go to. And as is perfect for the podcast and so appropriate to an episode on food, I'm going to go to the toilet. So goodbye, (laughs) listener. Thank you for listening and goodbye.